So it is my very great privilege and honor today to have with me Dr. Merton Shaw, mythologist, storyteller, and I would say poet. Uh, poetic sensibility seems to fill all, all of his writing, whether it's specifically poetry or not. Um, and uh, he is the author of books such as uh, The Smoke Hole, Courting the Wild Twin, The Snowy Tower, A Branch from the Lightning Tree, and Scatterlings, um, which I have read all but one of <laughs> in preference for, and halfway through that one. The last, I didn't quite finish Scatterlings in preparation for our conversation today. But we, we agreed that we would talk about uh, the Grail and Arthurian legend. Uh, in our conversation today, although as such things go, we may wander off into other territory. And I, I had thought to begin the conversation by asking Martin what he thought of Sergei Bulgakov's uh, meditation on the Grail in his book, The Holy Grail in the Eucharist, where um, he's he's actually he's contemplating the meaning of of John nineteen thirty four. And he suggests that when the blood and water flow from the side of Christ, that it sacralizes the earth, that it kind of reunites heaven to earth through the blood and water that flowed um, through, through Christ's side. So it fills the earth with an extra sacramental grace um, so that Christ remains connected to the earth. Um, and the reason I wanted to ask him about this is I see like a, a, a a similar sensibility kind of floating through a lot of Martin's work. So if you want to tackle that and see what you have to say, we can start there. Yeah, thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, it has been some time since I wrote the book Snowy Tower. It was about 10 years ago. So a lot of the scholarship that went into that book, <laughs> as is often the way, has mildly drifted from my consciousness. But just to bring you up to speed for a second, and I, I will go to where you're, you're suggesting, you find me just returned from the forest, not metaphorically, but quite literally leading a wilderness vigil, having been out on a sit myself for a few days. And then tomorrow night, from Friday night through to Sunday, uh, up in the wilds of Dartmoor, where I live, I will be telling Passable from, it takes me three days to tell it, no notes, no nothing like that. And the only way an oral storyteller can flatter and court a story close enough that you can tell it is to remove all theory from your mind for a while. You just have to, you can't tell Parsifal what it is. You just have to absorb it. And then in the meat hall of your jaw, you start to speak it and see what happens. However, that's the job of the storyteller. The job of the mythologist is slightly different. That's where the scholarship, that's where the study comes in, that's where the symbolism comes in. And images such as you describe, uh, the notion of a redemptive, you know, the blood as a redemptive thing that causes the vines of the world to refine themselves, that's throughout Wolfram, actually. Um, there are, as you know well, and probably many of our viewers know well, there are all sorts of different grail stories with all sorts of different heroes that find it. The one that I have been fixated on for many years is this character, Parsifal. And the variant of Parsifal I've studied, you can tell because it has a Z and a V in it, comes from someone called Wolfram von Eschenbach. Now, Eschenbach was a German, he was a knight, he wasn't really a theologian, and he's what they call a minnesinger. So that's a German version of a troubadour. He was a singer of love. And it is tempting because he's gossipy and bullish and a bit macho on occasion, to think that his telling is more secular than others. But actually, as we briefly discussed before we came on air, as soon as you get into Wolfram, it is suffused with Christian mysticism, the influences of Persia, and also, of course, as we find in all of these stories, coming down from Wales through the Norman courts into the south of France, Peridur from the Mabinogion. And it all starts to cook up to become this phenomenal, um, this phenomenal uh, story that is passable. 
and which leads us, of course, into speculation about the grail. Um, that's all I'll say. Ask me again in a few minutes when my mind is going. Something we should probably flag up for history's sake is that a few minutes ago, the queen of my country died very unexpectedly. And an hour ago, we had a queen. And as the bell rang in the town only a minute or two ago, we now have a king. So, and we have a king, ironically, who is very interested in the grail. Charles is a, a friend of lots of friends of mine. He has deep esoteric interests and has done for a long time. But I find myself slightly in shock as, although I would not describe myself as a monarchist, in the, the deep inner rhythm of Britain, the matter of Britain, you know, the kings, the queens, the sovereigns, this has a, a primordial hold on us as their subjects. Uh, so, so forgive me if I if I become too tangential. It's because, you know, major news is just a rhyme. Yeah, rather or shattering. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> I can only imagine what that's like as an American. You know, it's like you know, there's nothing really to compare that to. I mean, we've certainly we've, the death of a president um, is certainly eventful, but it's not. It's not like it doesn't have the same symbolic resonance for sure. No, it was the, one of the last great poet laureates of Britain was Ted Hughes. Mm -hmm. Now, the trouble with taking on any sort of uh, role like that is you often start writing terrible poems. <laughs> it, it, it's, as if, it's as if the muse immediately abandons you. But Ted said, I remember him being interviewed, this was way back when I was very young, but Ted also lived in Devon where I am. And he said, you know, I see it as part of the, you know, the tribal arrangement of Britain, that there is a bard at the center of things. And as long as, as long as that arrangement holds, I'm happy to be the laureate. And if it breaks, that's fine and something else will happen. But of course, when I think about Arthur, when I think about the Dux Velorum, the leader of men, I think about Merlin, I think about Morgana Le Fay, I think about, I'll be interested, maybe we talk about it one day. For me, Arthur's psychic twin, really, in Britain is Robin Hood. Mm. There's a real connection between the two of them. When you next get back to Scatlings, keep looking, because you'll find half right. a chapter at least on this issue. I actually did skim that part. No, I wouldn't. So I did. I, I, I caught that. And I'm still trying to sort it out. But I can see, I can see where you're going with that thread, though, for sure. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's an old idea that when the center is in crisis, you always go to the edge for the information, right. a la a quest, a la leaving Camelot, risking very likely death and going out to the fringes of the imagination to see what is dwelling there. Um, the problem these days, I think, is we have too much fringe dwelling and not enough Camelot. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so I know lots of brilliant people that wandered into the bush many years ago, but don't have the facility to come out again. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's always a counterweight between the centre and the edge. Um, so that's why, for me, when the edge, when the centre becomes corrupted, it's Robin Hood and his Greenwood Christian dreaming, really, which is what it is, robbing the rich to feed the poor. Uh, he reminds Arthur, he reminds whoever the sovereign is, the king or the queen at the centre, uh, of what true culture should look like. Mm. Nice. You know, you mentioned Camelot, and I heard you say something that caught my attention in, in one of your other interviews. I think it might have been the interview that you did with my with my online friend, Marcus Connolly, uh, who has the More Christ yeah, channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good guy. And, great guy. Um, and I and I, I believe you said something about Christian worship trying needing to become more like Camelot. Can you maybe expand on what you meant by that? Because that really captured my imagination. And then maybe talk about what the meaning of Camelot is, uh, since you were just mentioning it. Well, the round table, of course, we're we're seeing the Eucharist, we're seeing Pentecost, we're seeing we're seeing heaven on earth for a moment. We're seeing an ideal. Uh, that lives, I was talking, I, I, I'm not, I haven't quite gone under the cosh yet with uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, but I'm terribly close. 
And I have a wonderful father, Father Perforius, who I speak to most weeks and has led me very much into the mysteries of the divine liturgy, which is a phenomenal, a phenomenal jaw dropping thing to encounter in middle age. But he he reawoke an expression in me recently. He said, true Christianity invokes noblesse oblige. It's noblesse oblige. In other words, if you are noble, you have to act noble uh, and your legs should totter under the weight of the vocation that Christ bequeathed. As you put on the mind of Christ, your legs should be tottering. <laughs> and of course, all our legs are tottering. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know what it was like for you, but I didn't experience much of that vocational energy when I was younger. I experienced a lot of evangelical zeal but that wasn't quite the same thing as feeling that I had entered what the Irish philosopher John Moriarty calls divine ground, divine mm. ground, and that you are in a temenos, you are in a place set apart. This church right here, whether there's three people in it or 300, this is the navel of the world. This is the leafy Yggdrasil of the world. And that tree is going right up into angelic realms we barely have the names for. So in other words, I think what I'm getting at is um, I feel modern Christianity has let it, its mythology is lying in rubble around its feet. Mm -hmm. I feel that we have so compromised ourselves to modernity yes we can barely remember what we stand for anymore and that is a very unattractive scent someone said once that desperation is the world's worst cologne and uh, sometimes i watch i watch as we try as christians to squeeze ourselves into yet another more appropriate shape for modern society but we forget christian culture because culture and society i don't think are quite the same things mm. so i'm 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 all for questing I, what what's Worth life it. without a quest i'm all for camelot i'm all for people closing their eyes imagining a round table and saying you know, who resides at this round table? Who is still present? Because sometimes you can close your eyes and you realize there's only two or three people left. So I suppose what I'm getting at in my roundabout way, and I'm afraid I am a, as an oral storyteller, I'm a roundabout kind of guy. Um, it's to do with a certain kind of electricity. I hear a lot in Christianity about a vision well, what I want to argue for is vision is great, but what about dreaming? Mm. What about dreaming? The Aboriginal cultures, the indigenous cultures of which I am so sort of passionately inspired and engaged with would could possibly say that there are parts of Christianity that has forgotten its original dreaming and the grail is part of the Christian dreaming. The reason why I was so struck by the liturgy, the divine liturgy and, and orthodoxy in general, I saw a T-shirt the other day and it said, orthodoxy, keeping it real since AD 33. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was very pleased, but that was wonderful. <laughs> but but I, I, I felt I had entered a kind of a, a, a dream time. And as the hours passed, the doors through many centuries opened and I came out fundamentally rewired. And when I'm rewired, that means my heart changes and it opens towards the world again. It opens towards the earth again. So again, in my roundabout way, I just think that the new, the Christ event is actually so phenomenal, so shattering. It's extraordinary that 2000 years after that particular moment, we're still caught in the shockwaves of it. And if I may say for a moment, I'm a well-known mythologist. I've studied stories and myths from all over the world. And, uh, you know, you get, into the, you get into the synoptic gospels, you get into the gospel of Mark especially, and you're dealing with more than a symbolic field. You're dealing with a myth that has crashed down into a time signature of life that we all recognize. And it was Mark really, because for me, I, I've been a, I've been out of the game in terms of Christianity for, for many, many years, since I was 17. 
but it was Mark that was a comp one of several things that I began to suspect this, this, this doesn't ring to me like a fiction. This is beginning to feel like something uh, that actually happened. And I think part of the miracle of that eruption is the effect it's still having in the world to this day. We all know that the church has often been a total nightmare. Of course we do. As soon as human beings get involved with ideas, you know, Christ holds us to such a high bar, you know, well, to me anyway, it's, 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 it's always, there's always going to be an enormous gap between what we can actually pull off as, as human beings and, uh, you know, the velocity of the invitation. But um, anyway, please butt in. Well, but Mark, Mark, yeah, particularly, there's something particularly about Mark's gospel because it's so straightforward and the language is so plain and direct. It kind of like almost reminds one of the, of the Norse sagas only without the exaggeration um, and uh, just the flatness of the language um, in Mark's gospel. So I can see what you're saying there. It does, it, ju it just seems like, and it includes details that are just like, why would you include them unless they were true? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's the, you know, when you've got Jesus sort of spitting and kind of prodding people, and is this working yeah. and, and all yeah. of that? Yeah. You exactly. get, Hold on, this is sounding like on the ground mayhem. You know, yeah. this is, this is sounding like a, somebody under a lot of pressure doing things that are both miraculous and terrifying to the people around him you know yeah so for me um my my journey back to christianity i was raised uh pentecostal um but i was like basically agnostic by the age of 12 but there was never any and i was never an atheist though and Jesus always like kept, there's never been a time where Jesus did not have a hold of my imagination, but Jesus didn't always have a hold of my reason. And I was very much a person who leaned into my reason. And I think that like Christianity, like one of the things that's happened, I don't, I don't think Steiner was wrong to suggest that Christianity had allowed itself to become harmonically influence where it's just like it's too much into modernity and too much into materialism and it's a loss some um, of that dreaming that mm -hmm. enchantment that that it, th and part of that is like making the lines between the christian and the pagan too stark to not really embrace the idea that 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 in christ you find all things like that all things are bound into christ um which is something that the older Christian sensibility had that we somehow seem to have lost along the way. So I had to come back through reading older things in order to have a vision of a Christianity that was different than I even thought was possible based on the Christianity, the Christianity that I was raised with. So I mm -hmm. became Catholic in the mid nineties. That didn't, that didn't stick either. <laughs> I've had recurring bouts of Gnosticism or of agnosticism throughout my life. But and then in recent years, it really it's like Owen Barfield in particular was a big influence on like waking me up to like the truth bearing properties of the imagination. And the fact that Jesus had never lost hold of my imagination wasn't meaningless, that 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 had real meaning. And I just felt the need to be connected to that. And then I ended up Anglican of all things because my son came to me. <laughs> my son came to me one day uh, uh, when I was in the middle of church shopping a few years ago. And he's like, dad, I think I want to be Anglican. And I hadn't made up my mind yet. And I, but I was like, ah, Anglican. Yeah. It's the one thing I never considered when I was doing my, my seeking in my, uh, in my earlier years. And I'd always just written it off. And then rather than actually argue with me, he just pointed at my bookshelf. And it's like, there were like half of the theologians whose books were on my bookshelf were Anglican. So I'm like, okay, point taken. So that's where we ended up. I have a, as a Christian, I have an absolutely pragmatic approach. Look, the Holy Spirit, as we know, goes where it will. Right. Uh, and it's landed beautifully in the hearts of many Anglican writers uh, in the last 100, 150 years. Yes. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, are you aware of William Barclay? Yes. 
you know, William Barclay, if you if you go to his commentaries, which my dad very kindly gifted me, you go to his commentaries on the New Testament and you are reading, you know, erudition on, on a level of, you know, one, one of the really, really great exponents uh, of the 20th century. So I'm very pragmatic. I go, I go where the nutrient is. I go where the information mm -hmm. is. So it might be that in the morning I'm at the Divine Liturgy, but in the afternoon uh, I'm reading William Barclay or I'm watching, you know, um, Bishop Barron. Uh, right. You know. Right. Oh, I still, I mean, I'm, I, I mean, this is, I still pray the rosary in Latin every day. So, I, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still a little bit of a free agent when it comes to my practice. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, and where do you live? Where are you based? I live in Olympia, Washington. Oh, wow. In the Pacific okay. Northwest. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, I gigged in Tacoma, Port Townsend. Oh, yeah. I have real. I had a dear friend who was a mythologist and storyteller there called Danny Deardorff, great pal of mine. Uh, I love that area. It's beautiful. It's really yeah. oxygenated, and in a strange way, uh, very similar to Wales. So it has yeah. almost a sort of pseudo Celtic feeling. I kind of agree with you. And there's something about like like I don't know if it's just like I guess maybe it's just the connection to like. Yeah, I, I, I kind of I don't know if I could articulate it, but I, I kind of see that sensibility. Certainly there's a there's a similarity in terms of climate. We're a very damp green place. So thinking about thinking about the grail for a minute, yeah. thinking about the notion we have in Wolfram that it's a, a stone. One of the images that first led me into the story was a character called Kundry, you familiar with Kundry? Yep. How would you describe Kundry? Uh, how would I describe her as um, <laughs> as like kind of like she's like a witch, basically, like kind of she fits the witch archetype in terms of like her uh, appearance. Kundry for me is. Uh, again, for, for anybody that doesn't know who Kundry is, Kundry is one of the really loyal defenders of the Grail. Right. But she's startling because in the troubadour tradition where this story comes from, uh, you have what they call the far distant lady. And that was the woman that the troubadours all composed their love poems to. And she's up in a window. Uh, she's almost like a stained glass apparition, very beautiful, filled with what the Jungians would call anima possession. But Kundry has tusks. She has her eyebrows are so long, they're plaited and tucked behind her ear. Some say that she has nine breasts sort of lactating. Some say that she has, you know, the suspicious eyes of a boar and the, you know, the snout of a lion. And yet she is absolutely devoted in her nature to the deepest and most exacting forms of, you know, Christian living. And it's only it's when Parsifal is at his most lost and when Parsifal is intoxicated by the praise that Arthur is giving him, Kundry bursts in at a, an outdoor feast they're having and says, Arthur, your fame will lag in the ditch if you keep praising this man. He was in the presence of the Grail King and he failed to ask the question that would have broken open the enchantment that lies over these lands. And she actually, in public, shames Parsifal sufficiently right. to set him out on the second and deeper part of the quest. Now, Parsifal faces this huge dilemma. How do I find something by an act of will that I previously located as an act of grace. I don't know whether you can do that or not, actually, but that's his predicament. And the thing that led me as a storyteller into thinking that I could probably tell Parsifal's story was not self-aggrandisement. It was that I could look back at my own life and I saw many situations where a question needed to be asked and I failed to ask it. So it was in the it was in the great error of Parsifal that I found my own way into the story. But of course, 
if Parsifal had failed, if 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 Parsifal had asked the question, he he meets the Grail King twice. Second time he pulls it off. Sorry, plot spoiler. <laughs> first, first time around, first time around, he fails. But in the failure, he moves into the great deepening that actually, you know, rehydrates his soul, shows him what humility is, and gradually over time, incrementally the true mythology of the grail reveals its hand. Over the years, I've dreamt, I've dreamt a few times about the grail. And it's interesting as I go to tell it tomorrow night, although Wolfram would have us think of it as a stone, I must admit, somehow it seems, it seems to be more of a grail shape in my imagination. And I, you know, I, I've dreamt, I, I've dreamt several times that, of course, and forgive me, these, these are very straightforward observations, but I thought, well, of course, in the universe we exist in, the earth itself is a grail. Right. It is, you know, and I heard a voice in the dream said, did I not give you corn to eat? Did I not give you animals to hunt? Did I not give you oceans full of fish? And you have poisoned your own grail. So it has enormous significance for me on the, on the level actually of climate emergency. And of course, then um, I think of the grail that lived in Mary's belly. I think right. about the alchemy of Yeshua, you know, coming into existence. So the grail is a thing. I, I don't know what your, I mean, I love the title of your podcast, Grail Country. I don't know if you have particularly concrete ideas around the grail, but part of its, its vitality for me is that I think I know what it is and it slips like a salmon slightly out of my hands. What about you? No, I think that's, well, that's right. And I, and I think it's appropriate it ought to, but there's, there's, part of my, there's part of me that wants to connect it to the earth itself. Like that, 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 that somehow it has a connection to, to, to the idea of Sophia or at in, in the aspect of like the restored anima mundi, which I think is, which is, I think where Bulgakov is going with his, with his grail meditation, because he's a sophiologist. So like he's, he's, he's ending up in, in talking about how the blood and water um, restore and resacralize the earth that represents like the restoration of 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 the creaturely Sophia as the true anima mundi and 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 kind of like the the earth slipping away from the from the grasp of the serpent, who's its who's like its false ruler. Could you unpack for me? Sorry, I'm sort of turning the table. No, I'm just. Could you unpack for me a little bit about your your what your experience of this word Sophia? Okay, so I um, one of our one of my regular conversation partners on this channel is uh, Dr. Michael Martin, uh, yep. who for, of the Center for Sociological Studies, and so I um, prior to one of the reasons that I became acquainted with Dr. Martin is that we were interested in reading a lot of the same stuff. <laughs> when I started reading his books, it's like, oh, we're reading all the same stuff. So. Um, I had been reading a, a lot of uh, Bulgakov, and I had been reading um, Soloviev and uh, the, some of the Russian sophiologists, and then I started reading Michael's work. And Michael actually, he actually broadens it and takes a look at the work of uh, Burma and um, uh, some actually some inf some sociological influences within uh, within England actually um, in the early modern period. Um, probably under the influence of Boma's work. Um, and so I, we started having him on and having dialogues. Um, but I, I think that ultimately this idea, Sophia, is a word that is trying to describe the, the relationship between God and the world. Like that's what it ultimately is. And that 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 relationship is accomplished through 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 Sophia. I'm very attracted to that because what one of the things I think like you know ma many people is that I was struggling over the years with you know 
the fathers and the sons and all of that kind of thing. And I was looking for some kind of feminine energy yeah. that was there from the very beginning of things, which of course we see in the Old Testament when Sophia actually gets to speak, she says, I was, I was his carpenter, you know, I was his right hand woman. I was there at the beginning of things. And one of the reasons I think that I found and I find the Beatitudes so incredibly hard to live up to is I find them very feminine. Mm -hmm. Those those attributes, the particular disciplines that Christ lays out, that's a fear knowledge for me. Uh, it might have come out at that moment in the body of a man, in the body of Christ, but I'm... I'm I'm new to it, so which is which is why I was I'm always listening for good conversation. Right. So, yeah. So opening yeah, that up. Right. So and I think it's also to me it's also about the marriage of spirit and soul because like the like kind of like the masculine and feminine aspect that exists within each of us too, because like we have both, and I think that like. And there's also a, definitely a strong connection between Sophia and, and, and Mary for Bulgakov and Soloviev and, and even and even for Boma. So like there's there's a strong association between Ma Mary and Sophia to the point where it's almost as if Mary is an incarnation of Sophia in a way. And I just think like to me, like that's part of what was missing from the Christianity of my childhood is that there was absolutely no connection to the earth or the feminine in it whatsoever. It had just been like pulled out of it, even though it's actually, it's actually there when you dig deeper within the tradition. Mm. So for me, mm. at least. Well, that I like, you know, I like to hear that. And I'm sure a few thousand <laughs> other people I know want to hear that as well. Uh, I would love to see many wild, Kundri-esque, right. teeth-gnashing, beautiful wild women re-inhabit the great invitation that is Yeshua. Uh, and I and I think that I think that that could happen. But it's as you're saying, um, it just needs to be highlighted a little bit more. If you see Christianity from a distance, it, you you can, in comparison, for example. If you look at Greek mythology, it is filled with extremely potent, devious, powerful uh, goddess figures flying mm -hmm. around, getting up to all sorts of things, revealing every aspect of the human psyche that you could possibly imagine. But then we have Mary, of which, I mean, how much is actually written about Mary in the Gospels? Page and a half, something like that, if you put it all together. Right. Not a lot. But... That's historical Mary, mythological Mary, cosmic Mary, Earth Mother Mary, the right. Mary phenomena I'm very interested in because it is it speaks to me of a profound need in human beings to have the feminine, you know, within the mix. I don't think I don't think many people at all want to. Uh, and, and you're exactly right. I mean, I'm not getting specifically a, a gender conversation. I'm right. just talking about the feminine as as a clear and present energy. Correct. Yeah, that's all. That's what I'm talking about too. Which is why I say it's like I'm I'm, I'm no interest in a gender conversation at all. Those are they're inner, they're just energies that exist, and we we contain both of them, and we need mm -hmm. to bring them into harmony. That's that's what the marriage of spirit and soul is about. Ultimately, is the harmonization of those energies. So, what is the difference between spirit and soul? Do you think? I, spirit to me spirit this is just my opinion this is my opinion but this is as i read it soul is connected to the 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 uh, the bottom to the body directly it is like the animating spirit of the body there there is there's no separation between body and soul they're really they're, they're connected but the, but there's something deeper than just there's just something deeper than that which is the which is the part that God breathed into Adam's nostrils that that living breath of God and that that is the spirit that and that is the what is the real ground of our being, but the fall takes us the fall has taken us out of communion with that, where we are following we are allowing our soul to follow the body 
without bringing it back into union with the spirit. That is that is the best language I have to describe what I'm talking about. Mm. I like the I like the distinctions that you're making. It was a big moment in my own life, and it's it's very well, you know, it's not a, any form of original thought. There's huge history with it, but beginning to make distinctions between spirit and soul is is very healthy. I think. Um, I used to use the comparison. I said, do you remember, you know, President Obama? Yes, we can. Do you remember that's what he said when he's trying? Yes, we can. Well, that's a, a beautiful spirit led, important thing to say. It has hope within it. However, soul doesn't enter uh, that kind of thing at all. Soul comes in when limit is involved and diminishment is involved and things get smaller and within myth, that means uh, it means going to hell. It means the underworld right. journey. Yes. And that when, you know, you look at, I'm, I love to look at old people's faces and I have black and white photographs where I live of Georgia O'Keeffe, the painter, Samuel Beckett uh, and others. And you see my friend, the comedian is Irish comedian, Tommy Tin, and he says, I want to be around people where I look at their face and see decisions that they've made are marked upon them. So he's always looking, Tommy's always looking for a priest that is really a crow. <laughs> you know, he's always <laughs> looking for that. And I, you understand, but that's soul. And soul is the journey. Spirit, you know, I equate with success, vitality, ambition. I think the I think the secular world celebrates soul to, to some degree. I mean, sorry, to, to spirit to some degree. But soul is is far more complex uh, because soul is often soul works with the idea that we become true human beings, not by endless possibility but how we actually deepen into things gradually being taken away. When well, we by, by being is... tied to the body, that makes it tied to, ma to, to matter. And, yeah. and, you know, and ultimately the, the root of matter is, is mother. So mm. it's, it it, it's tied to the earth, which is, which is interesting. It's like, I, when, when you talked about Kundry, like part of your part, like when Kundry, like it, the, the second time she speaks, you almost expect there's almost this expectation of a transformation because of the because of the difference in the word she's speaking. You almost expect this transformation, but there's no such transformation. She remains in that guise of like kind of what you would expect of like the witch, right? And mm -hmm. she's very she remains a very earthy character, even though she's connected to the Grail. Yes, there is no that. Yes, she doesn't suddenly. Thank goodness, you don't peer under the veil, and there's this this sort of you know young cherub gazing at you. No, she remains tusked. She remains testy. These are qualities in her that are not to be transmuted but celebrated. Interestingly, I think in Wolfram, the rumor is that originally she's from India. Mm. Uh, and she's made her way across and gradually been sort of inculcated into the into the into the Grail family, but of course, with my with my years of telling stories, we have figures in Russian fairy tales like Baba Yaga, yeah. who are also what they really are are great initiators within the field of human consciousness. They are exacting crossroads moments. Uh, it's you have to display supreme intelligence. You have to be quick on your feet. Otherwise they gobble you up and you deserve it. Uh, and I love the fact that actually it's really what brought me into Passable that it's her, you know, you know, one of the old Scandinavian words for poet is scald. So to be scalded ah, 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 is yeah. to be scolded, to be scolded. And that was part of, you know, in Ireland, you had satire. In Scandinavia, you had scalding. A wordsmith had tremendous magic. They had power because they could reduce a sovereign to rubble by their word hoard, by their language. And it's actually the deepest prompt, the deepest prompt Parsifal gets from the Christian world, in my opinion, is from, from a woman with tusks. 
Right. Uh, and that is beautiful to me. And um, it, um, yeah, it's what led me on my long journey with Parsifal. It's very sweet to be even having this conversation because the book had no effect whatsoever in the world when it came out. It was like throwing gold into the Grand Canyon. You know, you just don't hear it land. Um, uh, it's the only book of mine that's ever, I have to say, it's ever really tanked. Oh, uh, really? And I, I, I care about that book. I love that book. That's why I still tell the story. It's probably books. Books are totemic, and they have their moment. And the the moment for Snowy Tower may not have come yet. It right. might come at some other point. I don't know. Right. Well, well, I, I would certainly recommend it to oh. anyone who's listening to this. I, I thought it was fantastic. Um, what? Nathaniel, what do you think needs to happen in Christianity? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I think that... I think that we need to... Hmm, boy. That is a... Let me think. I've thought a lot about this, but for some reason... Um, you, you know, when you put me on the spot, it's like, I, I'm very hesitant. I would say that I'm going to give you a very, I'm going to give you Rene Girard's answer, because I think it's the best answer I could give. I think what, what needs to happen with Christianity is that Christians need to act like Christians. And, and I think we need to understand what that means. Um, and I think that we we can't continue to think that Christianity is just something that just fits neat, neatly with a, you know, bourgeois middle-class lifestyle and that, you know, Jesus, you know, didn't mean some of the things that he said seriously and that maybe we should take a commitment to um, self-sacrifice and nonviolence seriously. Um, so, yeah, I would say that ultimately I would I would say that Gerard gave the best possible answer because I think that's those are things that Christians do. Um, mm. They are they are willing to give of themselves, um, and they are willing to be peacemakers, and um, they are more interested in meeting needs than hoarding up comforts. So yeah, yeah. I would say that's what needs to happen, yeah, and I don't mean that in a political way. I don't, I don't want that to come off as a political statement at all, because I don't, because I'm actually disinterested. I don't, I think that I, I'm disinterested in the church becoming involved in politics. I don't think that's the pathway. I think it's really just through inspiring people to, to actually pick up their cross and follow Christ. And what does beauty have to do with that? I think beauty is, I I think beauty has everything to do with that because beauty is the only sensibility that allows you to see the truth of it. Because if you rely on your reason, Christ, the things Christ say don't make any sense to your rational mind, like love your enemies. That's beautiful. It is beautiful. And you know, instinctively it's beautiful. The moment you hear it, you know, it's true, but you don't know it's true through the way in which it makes absolute rational sense. And of course, why wouldn't you love your enemies? No, you see the beauty in the act of loving your enemies and you see what that can bring, what that could possibly, the fruit that that could bear in the world if people actually did that. So it's through beauty that you are able to see that it's true. So I would say beauty is, we need to, we really need to make beauty primary. In fact, I think we've, we've, we've made truth, we've made truth the ultimate value in a sense at the expense of beauty, I think. Mm. I think beauty is the answer to the question you asked me at least half an hour ago about, you know, what do you mean church should be like Camelot? Yeah. What I mean is it should be beautiful. It Mm -hmm. should be transformational, transformational, not transactional. You know, that, that, that's what I'm getting at. And so, you know, I'm not trying to crowbar, uh, you know, a West of Britain ethnicity or a visual look into churches. <laughs> right, right. World. Nothing like that. Whatever your version of Camelot is, whatever your version of real beauty is, because beauty rearranges the heart and it, it, it troubles us into communication. I've always said that reverie leads to participation. Mm-hmm. Reverie 
reverie leads to participation. It means it makes us reach out to the universe again. And that is why I, I've said this several times, but I'll, I'll say it again. My experience of not becoming a Christian, because I didn't really become a Christian, I just realized I was a, a really bad version of a Christian. Yeah, right. right. Uh, but since then, I'm under the I'm under the the sort of daily spiritual audit of Yeshua. And I feel like that temple that he walked into, which was filled with doves and cash and people of, you know, ambivalent morals. And he's been walking through every room in my setup. <laughs> There's some rooms I really don't want him to go into, right. but he's lifting his lantern and having a look. And, and I think, I think that once you've been through a process like that or are in a process like that, that stuff changes your life. That it absolutely changes your life. You know, come find out. That's what he says. Put down your nets, you know, put down your nets. And in my own life, I'm trying to put down my nets. You know, I'm trying to walk out. Do you remember that story when he, the, they ask one of his disciples said, should we be paying tax? Mm -hmm. And he says, go out you know, go out and, and collect a fish. And he collects the fish as he's done for thousands and thousands and thousands of times before. And there's the money to pay the tax yeah. in the mouth yeah. of the fish. Right. And it makes me think about things I do in my own life by rote and repetition. And then one day, like Lewis, I get to the back of the wardrobe and there's Narnia. One day I look into the mouth of a fish and there's the coins. And I believe that true Christianity brings you much closer to those possibilities much closer to that kind of mystery that kind of beauty that kind of wonder right and, and like yeah those kinds of miracles that, because it's like you know sometimes jesus asks hard things but then there's also like some of his miracles suggest like an unimaginable plenitude yeah that's that that we just can't that we don't we can't see there's something there's something broken in our relation to the world so that there's a there's a plenitude there that we could access if we learn to see it like what there's a there's a there's a part of the gospels after he's performed the miracle of the loaves and the fishes and he comes back to the boat with the this, he's he's walked on the water and he comes back to the boat with the disciples and he mourns the fact that they didn't understand about the loaves of the fishes and and it comes right after he's just walked on water too so it has something to do with the with the disciples like failing to see the way in which the infinite is a directly accessible within the finite if you have eyes to see it mm. like this just absolute plenitude mm. And yes. that what and but that something has to change in our vi in, in in our vision and also I think well it's and, but I think it's it, I definitely in the Hebrew there's a, in the Hebrew uh, worldview there's definitely an emphasis on on hearing where it's like you hear first before you see like even if but even when it goes wrong because if you look at the temptation in the Garden of Eden Eve actually hears the voice of the serpent before she looks at the fruit. So it's like the hearing guides the, the vision, which is why the storyteller role is so important, Martin. Mm. Because that's what you're that's what you're doing. It's like you're you're telling the stories in order to evoke the dreaming. Yeah, that that is it. That is it. And I would implore anybody that is out there watching this to think to consider the notion that they could try try just a little bit of that themselves and to look at look at the lives of the saints look at the lives of the wild old women the irascible old strange look at the life of mary of egypt look at saint seraphim and bring those stories off the page and and bring them back into your heart and your mouth again and you will create uproar i promise you with those stories spiritual uproar right and that's really you know um I am endlessly interested in theological debate. Uh, I, you know, uh, I've been a, a Stanford professor. I've done all sorts of things, but I'm really excited in terms of my own tiny contribution to where Christianity is at this moment. It's just really kind of showing Christians again, 
the stuff that still has undomesticated, uncorralled, mysterious energy to it. Uh, and I'm not looking, I'm not looking to do that for self aggrandizement. I'm just trying to encourage everybody to say, listen, there really is such a thing as Christian mythology and you should pick it up because it'll give you all the information you think you were denied about the climate, about how to love, what to defend, what to give ground for. There aren't just hundreds of these stories, there's thousands of them. Uh, and I'm just energized by that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I forgot what I was gonna say. So yeah. Um, Hmm. what is it that you find so so what is it that you find energizing and why do you think like is this connected to the to this uh to this camelot notion that you mentioned earlier it is and it's connected to beauty and it's connected to falling back in love with the world again you know jesus is yeshua is he comes for more life you know more life uh and and you feel more life when you are not just seeing the world but beholding the world that's coming back to something that you raised a minute ago in scatlings i say look look the big spiritual move and you get this all over the world is when you stop looking and seeing the predicaments of your life and you start beholding or wondering over the, the predicaments of your life. The greatest philosophers wander and, it's the same word really, wander and wonder mm. on the tongue. They think out loud. And that's, I, do you remember the book Smoke Hole that you've read? Yeah. One of the things, or listen to, one of the things that I say in the book is underneath your feet, you have a little prayer mat. Yeah. And that prayer mat contains the family you were born into, the strange bit of earth that you live on, all the different disappointments and euphorias you've been through, and to entertain the notion that there is an intelligence to, a, a greater intelligence to what you've been provided with, and you are to be the story carrier of that moment, of that prayer mat. Stop looking at other people's fields. Stop looking and comparing yourself to others. That's going to send you crazy. That's a that is a that is a manipulation of the world, really. But just pay attention to your little prayer mat, because again, to quote this chap, I keep mentioning John Moriarty. Uh, I did a book on John Moriarty, which is why I'm doing this. Um, it's divine ground. It's the ground underneath your feet. It's the mythic ground you stand upon. It's it's the only thing that is truly and profoundly indigenous to you. So mm. do pay attention to it rather than, you know, most of my friends, you know, and probably myself at different points, us, the West, ironically, our self-esteem is far lower than you might expect. And despite our initial hubris underneath the surface, it takes almost nothing to reduce us to rubble. We suspect we're grotesque. And therefore, gobbling ayahuasca or gobbling some exotic spiritual practice is a very natural thing to do because we're trying to we're trying to get in touch with something that feels magnificent and real and connected to the voltage of the earth and the heavens. Um, but the place to start, and we find this again and again, is the ground you actually stand on. Uh, and I say in Scatlings, until you trade growth for depth, not a lot is going to happen because we are the tyranny of freedom where we live these days, the tyranny of we can be anything, do anything. You know, we see on the television, you can be anything you want to be. But myth says the opposite. Myth says, no, 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 no. You're not meant to be anything you want to be. You're meant to be something quite specific within Greek myth you have something called a daimon that was an arrangement before you were born, before you were born into your family. There's a constellation. There are things that you're meant to live through. There are words you're meant to say. There are stories that you're meant to tell. 
I'll leave you with one before I finish this bit. Here's an image, uh, Nathaniel. In Irish myth, when the, um, the fairies gather around the fire at night and the storytellers come out, the stories that the Irish fairies listen to are the tales of our lives. Mm. So the, the Shanaki, the bards, the traditional storytellers over there with the people of the Shi, the gentry, the Benji, the people of the hill, the stories they tell, the myths they tell are of our lives, our love affairs, our disappointments. And so I urge all of us that we have to live a life interesting enough to keep the fairies entertained around the fire. That's really interesting to me, um, in particular, because um, Bulgakov, in his book on angels, Jacob's Ladder, he, in distinguishing between, like, the differences between the angelic and the human, he, first of all, he has this idea that angels have, like, a co-humanity with us, and we have a co-angelicity with the angels, and then he also suggests that the, one of the differences between the, the angelic and the human is that human beings and having a material body, they have a world, right? And they're able to interact with the world and the, the angels don't. So he talks about how the angels delight in the works of human beings. So that idea with the, that, what you were just talking about with the Irish idea of the, the fairy Mm. um telling the stories of human beings that's like a very similar idea um, well in a way it turns there's not a lot of pathos if you're going to live forever uh you know the charisma humans have a kind of strange charisma to them they have a a pathos to them because we know that our time is limited and that's what brings the counterweight to our days it's what gives the the tension it's what gives it its its weight and it's tragic beauty. The fairies, the immortals, they don't have that. They live in a far less, ironically, a far less sexy place because they're just <laughs> going to go on and on and on and on and on right. and on and on. Uh, and they know that after a while that can be a, quite a tyranny. So I love that notion that we are being witnessed. The great psychologist James Hillman, uh, who I was lucky to work with just once before he died, Hillman, who was connected to Henri Corbin and very much mm. connected to the ideas of the imaginal and the mundus imaginalis, Hillman always said, your individuation, your spiritual growth is not for you, it's for the benefit of your angel. You're doing right. it. It's a community act for a being you can't see. Mm. The, the angel in some way, as, you're, as you've just been saying, is stimulated by you know, the terrain of the human experience. Right. Yeah. Bulgakov also has the idea that like, essentially that the, the, the traditional idea of the guardian angel is actually like the, that is the angelic nature of you. Like, that's what your guardian angel is. It's like, that's, that's, that's the angelic nature that you are, you are actually tied to that shares that. And he talks about how in, uh, in revelation, when the, when the, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, it's said to have the measure of an angel and a measure of a man. So that, that co-humanity and co-angelicity is suggested even in the image of the new Jerusalem. Wow. It'll be interesting tomorrow night. It'll be about, it'll be just this time in 24 hours that I start telling Parsifal. And I know it will be influenced by this conversation. I, it, it's inevitable that something will start to happen. If, I don't there's know a, if there's a recording of it, please direct me to it. I would love to see it. I, I will. I, I keep them under wraps at the moment. I don't think that there's an audio recording of me telling it out because it's so long. Right, you know, very long. It, yeah, it, it begins on Friday night. We get to the end on Sunday afternoon, and usually by the time we get to the end, there's about twenty minutes of silence. No one says anything. There's there's a bit of a bit of sobbing, but that's about it. It takes a, it takes a long time. Um, 
I gave the story a break for a few years. Uh, stories are alive, you know. As a mm -hmm. storyteller, you don't want to be working with a pelt. You want to be working with a wild animal. And the story will talk to you and say, do you know what? You know, you've dragged me around North America enough. I need to go back to the cave now. And Parsifal did that. It said, look, you've put me in a book. You've put me in a play. I wrote a play about Parsifal. You've told it from here to Timbuktu. Now I need to go and back. I need to go back to Wild Mountain. You know, in the Grail story, you know, it, it's on a mountain. And we know that, don't we, about Eden, that those four rivers, they come yeah. out, they come out. So there's all those, you know, I think that Wolfram and Shreten de Troy and all of them way back, they're infiltrating images and stories from the Old Testament constantly and, and the new, actually. Uh, which is why I think it would be so ripe for people to be telling those stories. And I must, I have to petition at this moment, it's not enough for you to just read, but I'm not talking about you personally, I'm talking mm -hmm. about us. It's not enough to just read stories like that through a Jungian analysis or, a, a, you know, a poetical, just tell the bloody story tell it by a fire, and when you come to a gap in the story, and there's a few people listening, never say, and this is what this chapter means. Mm. You've done a great disservice to the alchemy of the moment. What can be interesting is to simply say, as I have a thousand times, where do you find yourself in the tale? Where do you find yourself in the tale? And you can say... I find myself in the snow looking at a thousand wild geese flying over a, a grey sky. I find myself uh, at the edge of Kundry's tusk. I find myself in the presence of the Fisher King. And when you do it like that, it's poetic, it's beautiful, and it flatters the story. But as soon as you say Kundry is an archetype of the blah, blah, it's all gone away. You can't do that. Don't, don't. Don't go near it with that language. Treat it, you know, I, I just, as I said, I have to keep saying this to folks because there's more, gradually mythologists are emerging, symbolists are emerging, and I absolutely salute it. But don't forget the act of storytelling within it because, frankly, that's where the magic is. Mm. Well said. Well said. It, it, treat, it treats both the story and the language us that as, as more of a living thing which i think there's something there's something christological about that to me because it it shows the connection of 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 christ as the word to christ as life mm. yeah but that's very you, and you know as you've said that that's very orthodox christ is life you mm -hmm. know that's right down into the bones of orthodoxy how do you, you know, it's one thing to experience Christ through opening, up, through opening up the Bible, but obviously Christ consciousness spills out of that book. It spills into everything around us till if we're lucky, we're back at that thing I mentioned earlier on, not just seeing the world, but beholding it. Where for you, you know, where, where do you feel closest to that to Christ when you're, you know, not, not in church, not reading a, a, a Holy scripture. I, I would say it's for me, it's, it's listening to music. For me, it's listening to music. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be religious music. So, and also, I, I mean, I see the other thing is, is like, I've just, to me, like, I can have it reading anything. It doesn't have to be Holy Scripture. Um, because there's a way in which, like, Christ as the word is the meaning that is behind all words. And that any, that any word spoken or written can be a revelation if you're open to it. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's the best answer I have for you. Yeah. It's, it's Augustine, isn't it? Who says all, all truth is God's truth. Yeah. You know, all truth is God's truth. So we can relax a bit. <laughs> that's how I always, I just relax, you know, yeah. it's okay. If, 
Angus Young from ACDC makes me weep when he plays guitar solos. Right, he does. right, he yeah, does. there, uh, right, exactly. Uh, you know, it's very odd, and it's it's one of the blessings of my life. My dad's a preacher, but we since since I was a kid, he said, "I'm going to play you some holy music now. This is called Deep Purple." <laughs> and you know, and 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 it was, and it is, and that will all. That's part right. of the, that's the conundrum for me. I've always said that great art is part of the trade for getting booted out of Eden, you know, because we're filled with what this is wonderful Welsh word hiraeth, which is longing. The mm. Greeks would call it nostos, longing for home. Yeah, right. But you're right, you know, music for me, whether it's Vaughan Williams or Jimi Hendrix playing Voodoo Child, it just reduces me to rubble. It just but, reduced, but longing is the right word because ultimately all longing is longing for God. Like that's, but it has to be that. That's why C.S. Lewis is surprised by joy when he distinguishes like the different, like wh what makes joy difference is that joy is always intermingled that with that longing. Yeah, like that's what makes joy joy. It's like you're in pursuit of something that you know you can't have, but you're pursuing it anyway. Yeah, Lewis is so good at that. Do you remember that wonderful line, uh, and Malcolm Guite turned me on to this, where Lewis says, you know, my imagination was baptized long before I became a Christian. Yeah, that's how I, yes, I resonate with that so much. Yeah. But that's what I said. Like, that's, that's what I said is like, there was never a time when Christ did not have a hold of my imagination. Yeah. But it took a long time for me to figure out like, what kind of Christian I was comfortable being. How did, how did Christianity fit into my life? How, how, how did Christianity fit with all the other things that, of all the other truth that I picked up along the way? Yeah. And I needed to see a vision of, uh, of, of Christ seriously gathering together all things mm. before I was ready to make that leap. Mm. And I had to learn to trust my imagination as a truth-bearing faculty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So what do you think of, do you think about William Blake much? Oh, yes. I love William Blake. Mm. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> <That's> all, <laughs> you know. it's hard not William, to. Blake, William Blake has these wonderful phrases. He says, you know, and this is actually, this is kind of in the Quran as well. He says, when you go to heaven, uh, your hands will testify against you and they will say to God, I went places I shouldn't have gone and your hips will say, me too. That's one that I like from Blake. A very famous one, uh, the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. That's great. And then there's that one that I luckily don't agree with, but I understand. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Mm -hmm. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom, or as Hillman would say, you never know when you've had enough till you've had more than enough. Right. Uh, right. And I think that that's something that happens. So why, what, what, what is your resistance there? Um, I think when I was younger, I first thought about that phrase in my 20s. And it, it encouraged me to push my edges very, very hard. And there was knowledge in that, and there was wisdom in it. But I know now, in a way I couldn't possibly have known in my 20s, that actually, and it's something I, I said about 20 minutes ago, really, people are defined by how how they experience limit, not how they experience endless freedom. And that is something interestingly, as a culture, we're under the gun in a way we've never been before. You know, we're all post lockdown, God willing, but I had a group of male friends round on Saturday night and these are very emotionally literate, strong men, they, they have families, they have jobs they love. And I said, does anybody else feel a bit lost? Everybody said, yeah. 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 What do you think is, what, what, what do you think that is? Why do you think that we have that, that feeling so has become so common in our time? 
I, I, there, there, there's any number of, of things I could say about that. I know it's real because I know I feel it myself. I know that there's a kind of, there was a surety I had three or four years ago that I don't have now, even though, of course, I may not be, I may not be the best person to answer that question because in a strange way, entering the stream of Christianity at 50, which is what I've done, it's not quite that I feel lost, but the ground that I'm in is so fresh and different. I don't quite know where I am at the moment. Right. Uh, so, so that's a real So there are question. different kinds of loss. So it's like, it's not necessarily a bad kind of loss. No, here's this, this is the distinction I would make. I wrote this, I wrote recently an essay for Emergence magazine. And they said, would you write about living with uncertainty, which is really what everyone expressed at the table. And the point of the essay is I say, let's make the move from living with uncertainty to navigating mystery. Mm. Let's navigate mm -hmm. mystery. Now that right. we can do something with. And I think the truth is, the metaphysical, mythological truth is, we are surrounded by profound mystery at this moment. And if we don't have the soulful anchoring of myth, spiritual life, relationship to other people, relationship to weather patterns, relationship to the earth, then we get caught with the uncertainty, but we have none of the mystery. And that is a dangerous place to be, I think, inside our own heads. Is there something about our individualism that makes it tough for us to even understand or negotiate mystery? I've been thinking about the difference for years. I've been thinking about the difference really between isolation and solitude. I spend an enormous amount of time on my own. Uh, and sometimes that's wonderful. And sometimes it's painful and it's frightening because I look forward in my life. And if I'm lucky enough to have a long one, I think, well, I don't want to be, you know, there's only so many cats in the house I can have, you know. So individualism, the cult of the cult of ourselves, which is if you're not, if you're not overtly looking in some sort of spiritual dimension, almost certainly you will get caught up in the religion of yourself, because every screen around us supports that narrative. It supports our supposed importance. Um, that's the what. That's why I like going to the divine liturgy because in any in any obvious way it's nothing to do with me you know at that moment i'm bearing witness to something no one's rubbing my back in fact my back will be hurting because i've been standing up for two hours <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so I, I don't know but something something is up things are not the same things have not just reverted to normal not in the psyches of people this is something i'll be thinking a lot about in the winter in next spring i think i'm going to go out on the road again come to canada maybe to north america touring there'll be a book out um i did a vigil for 101 days just before lockdown which is actually what led to my encounter really with with the mossy face of christ uh and the the beautiful predicament I now find myself in. Uh, but I do think that we are in deeply mysterious times and it would help to address it like that. Because as soon as it's just, we, it's uncertainty, we have, we've cut all the, all, all the soul, all the romanticism. And for me, romanticism is a beautiful word. It's not a, it's not a diminished state. It's, it's a deep thing, you know. Um, anyway, I've been here for ages and I should probably let you get on, but before <laughs> I go, Daniel, I just wanted to, I wanted to honor whatever it is you're doing. I think it's great. And please Thank take you. courage, continue to do it. Uh, and, uh, I hope I get and get a chance to come back and talk to you more. In the oh, future. absolutely. I would be glad to have you back. Thank you, Martin. Um, it's been a, been, been a wonderful time. Thank you for joining me today.